This is a production of Cornell University. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Evan, and um, thanks to the Department of Natural Resources for giving me this uh, opportunity to go beyond my usual repertoire of climate change slides. Uh, so I had to come up with a lot of new stuff. Uh, and this seminar is going to really reflect a lot of ideas that have been bouncing around in my head for some time. And I'm curious to see um, your reaction. The first thing probably is a little bit of uh, explanation about the title. I'll try to do that. In terms of us being unique, I mean, I do think, you know, just that so many people would show up to a seminar to hear about their own species being dethroned. <laughs> That's kind of unique about humans. Only humans would do that. Um, but, you know, that's not my objective. Um, I'm really hoping that, you know, uh, when you leave here, you'll, you'll really begin to recognize that there's a lot to be gained in appreciating what modern science is revealing about our similarities with other species, that the differences are really a matter of perspective. Um, our existential angst about being alone, well, we are not really so alone. Uh, we are not exempt from natural laws, as I'll emphasize quite a bit. We are not supernatural. And I think many of us academics, I will argue, when it comes to our intelligence, actually have that tendency. Um, and recognizing our limits might actually help us tackle our biggest environmental challenges. Um, so as was alluded to, I mean, I'm coming up soon on my 25th anniversary of doing climate change research. Um, and you know, in those years, there's really been two kind of broad surprises uh, that I've had. One is the magnitude and pace of climate change has been much more than I expected. I really, in fact, started by doing direct effects of carbon dioxide on plants, thinking that the climate change, while it would come, much of it would come uh, after my career. I didn't expect the Arctic to be melting uh, when I still had a, several years to go. Uh, the second surprise has been the persistence of denial out there. Now, I'm not talking about um, some valid debates about we have climate change and should we or shouldn't we do something about it, but this, this actual persistence of denial that it even exists. Um, and now there's actually, of course, quite a body of research. There's a lot of body of research on climate change per se, and now there's a growing body of research on why is there this denial. Um, I'm only gonna cover one little thread, and that's really gonna focus, I think, fairly relevant to this department, um, on evolutionary biology, the evolution of the, of the human mind, um, and how the, that, the, the cons this constrains our ability to tackle some of our global environmental problems. Okay, the word illusion. Um, I had thought about the word delusion, but that's got kind of a psychotic twist. <laughs> and I decided to be kind to our species and uh, call it illusion. That means we don't really have a take on reality. Um, and uh, uh, two, two components of that illusion I'll be emphasizing. One is that we are exempt from natural laws, which is kind of a pre-enlightenment era problem, but I'll argue academics are as guilty as anybody of still having a, um, a major fragment of that exemptionalism going on, and it has to do with our intelligence. Um, this idea that there's, there's no bound uh, of our intelligence in terms of the context of the evolution of our mind that we can think our way out of anything. Um, and a, an analogy that I often think about myself when I uh, wrestle with this issue is thinking about, uh, let's look at birds and there they have a, a special trait, obviously the ability to fly. Imagine um, eagles, for example, thinking, well, I'm at the top of the, I'm the best of all the flyers. And taking that information instead of sort of recognizing, but still there are limits because I have a certain wingspan, et cetera, thinking that you could fly anywhere, up to the heavens, to see the gods uh, throughout the universe. Uh, that's actually, I think, what many humans, uh, maybe many academics do with their intelligence. Um, the second illusion uh, related to the intelligence is that this leads to a level of self-awareness. And there's, of course, a whole continuum of self-awareness out there among species. And we're, uh, just as we can, you know, uh, uh, surpass most other species on an IQ test in terms of levels of self-awareness, uh, we are quite up there. Um, but it could be at a point where it's actually leading to an illusion, taking us away from reality. Um, Nicholas Humphrey, who's a theoretical psychologist, calls self-awareness a magical mystery tour we stage for ourselves. Um, is this adaptive? 
Uh, or is that an illusion that does not reflect ecological reality and that constrains our capacity to adapt? So that's my explanation of the, the title. And now I'm going to crank through uh, my slides. I have a lot of stuff to go through. A lot on kind of these issues uh, that I mentioned, sort of the evolution of the human mind, evolutionary theory, et cetera, to begin with. And uh, uh, kind of last, I'll get into its relevance to climate change. So first, this is kind of just an outline of what we'll be talking about. I'm going to talk about our place on the tree of life, going from our great chain of being, hierarchy uh, perspectives to modern evolutionary theory. I'm going to go through a scientific critique of the human exemptionalist paradigm. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, I have some papers you could, I could send your way after this. Um, but this is, um, leads us to a couple of issues. Um, you know, are complexity and intelligence really unique and quote, royal traits, or are they traits like any other? For example, flight, olfactory ability, et cetera. I'm going to talk about the mystical mind, how self-awareness and our, our quote, free will uh, leads us to a notion of being unbounded and exempt from natural laws. We have a little person between our ears. Really? A lot of us feel this way, and I think it's hard to divorce ourselves from that. And then finally, our complexity, intelligence, self-awareness, really adaptive traits, as I mentioned. Then I'm going to talk about the evolutionary and genetic constraints to human consciousness. And then finally, some realistic, uh, taking this information and developing more realistic approaches to addressing climate change and other environmental challenges. OK, uh, here's Aristotle's Ladder of Life. Um, it has a, uh, what was really viewed at the time, of course, there was, there was, uh, you know, is a, a static uh, collection of species that range in complexity. Of course, microbial life was not even uh, known about this time. Man, of course, is at the top. Uh, and notice that intelligence is, is up there at the top um, as well, not as simply some trait that we have, but as something that really takes us into the spiritual realm. Um, and I think that this is a place where, while today with modern ecology, we recognize that humans uh, interact with all of these species and are part of natural systems, but I think we often uh, get led into this notion that our intelligence is something quite unique um, and takes us to, uh, to the spiritual. This uh, Arist Aristotelian uh, notion got perfected during the Middle Ages into this so-called great chain of being. To, uh, many, many of the greatest thinkers of, um, for hundreds of years worked on the great chain of being, who spits where. Um, and there was a lot of uh, uh, philosophers of the day arguing, for example, that where we knew man was at the top and there had to be a god, so therefore there must be angels. There's a lot of philosophical articles about that. Um, St. So Thomas Aquinas uh, was, uh, took part in uh, some of this and was in that era. And um, interesting to me, having been raised a Catholic, where I kind of, uh, you know, what the nuns told us is only humans have a soul. Well, St. Thomas Aquinas didn't feel that way. He felt actually all living things had a soul, but humans had three souls and other species had one or two. So there's vegetative souls, sensitive soils, which would be what we call today sentient beings that might have some level of intelligence, but not able uh, with our uh, special rational thought. Um, and uh, this is kind of relates somewhat to an area of philosophy today that's called personal and non-personal minds. A personal mind is a mind that has not only intelligence, but a strong sense of self-awareness. Whereas a non-personal mind can be an intelligent being, but has a very weak or no sense of um, self-awareness. This hierarchy got perfected. Look at this list. Um, we got royalty at the top. This is the you know, work uh, by very, very serious scholars in the Middle Ages. Who fits where? I like where you know, actors today are like such big shots, right? Like they're like royalty. They're just below <laughs> beggars. Uh, of course, now we can wonder, you know, where would the graduate students, undergraduates, <laughs> professors be? But I'll leave it up to you. This all got completely turned on its head uh, with Darwin, of course. And of course, with a group like this, we can, can we ever say enough about Darwin? Everything I ever work on, he's already done it. Um, but he really did, uh, you know, revolutionize our thinking. And in fact, I would argue uh, what he came up with has not really sunk in, even among many ecologists. Um, today. 
uh, really the main thing, a non-creationist tree of life, not a hierarchy, um, that all the species that we see today have gone through the filter of natural selection in sort of an equal fashion. They've been carrying on their genes for at least some time. And some of them have been carrying on those genes for billions of years, whereas other species have been carrying on those genes like ourselves for maybe 100,000, 200, 300,000 years, something like that. But then we've all uh, gone through that, that same filter. There was a continuity, uh, evolutionary continuity, that um, the difference in intelligence between uh, creatures was not a difference in kind, but a difference in degree. Our own uh, Whitaker, the Whitaker Room over in uh, uh, Course in Mud, you're all, many of you are probably familiar with, uh, he was one of the um, uh, leading uh, ecologists who worked on the Five Kingdom Evolutionary Tree of Life, perfecting what we know about evolution, pri primarily from the fossil record, microscopy, dividing uh, uh, single-celled organisms into prokaryotes without a nucleus and eukaryotes, uh, protozoa here, um, uh, with a nucleus, and nutritional studies. Notice how this is dominated by multicellular life. Um, and humans still get up there somewhere near the top, probably the top of the animals, right? Um, and it gives you a perspective of uh, there is microbial life is now encompassed. Well, then along in the 1980s came a fellow named Carl Woese, who really kicked us uh, once again on this whole evolutionary tree of life thing and brought us into the molecular age, the molecular genetics age, and turned much of this on its head by evaluating the molecular genetics of even just the bacterial branch, he found if the, if the yardstick of what is a kingdom is the difference between a human and a mushroom, if that's the yardstick we're gonna use, then within the bacterial branch alone, there had to be at least a dozen different kingdoms. And he, he in fact discovered an entire new uh, domain of life, the archaea, uh, he was battled by many evolutionary biologists who were primarily fossil hunters, and this didn't sit too well uh, because uh, his, um, his results really show that, document very clearly how much of life on our planet has been microbial. Um, but uh, he made a major stamp almost as dramatic as Darwin's, I would argue. Here's the new evolutionary tree. It shows up in Campbell's biology book today. It's making it into all the textbooks. This is really um, talking about perspective. Um, here's three kingdoms of the old five kingdom tree, the fungi, animals, and plants right there. And this gives you definitely a different perspective of a few things. Um, first of all, this new tree is really based on the distances between these things really reflect evolutionary time. Um, all of this life is microbial. Much of the five kingdom tree and much of our talk about evolution in the past was based on the, it's an eye of the beholder uh, view of the world and how things work, uh, multicellular life. Also, when you think about this, I'm going to be talking in a moment about intelligence as an adaptable trait. You can see based on evolutionary time how, how it's been uh, really within the flick of an eye, how long we've been here and how long intelligence as a trait has been around. Uh, and so it really has not been well tested. Um, <laughs> um, but we still think, but yeah, 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 but we're, you know, but we win the IQ test, we're more complex than everything, and et cetera. But, uh, you know, evolutionary biologists have been you know, trying to bring home to people for many years, this is some, something out of Stephen Jay Gould's book some years ago, talking about that complexity does not equal progress as evolution goes. Um, evolution can actually move in either direction, but it's clearly bound by the left wall of minimal complexity. The upper panel is looking at Precambrian time, and uh, uh, the bottom panel is looking at today's uh, uh, distribution of species in sort of a cartoon fashion. As the number and kinds of species have increased over time, the right tail has obviously developed. Some things spill out into that tail. But uh, things can also go the other way, but they can't go against that left wall. So the numbers and frequency of the simplest forms have increased, but we've also developed a tail. The small number of species forming the tail do not indicate an evolutionary sequence of progress, just the inevitable consequence of the laws of probability. 
if we, with all of our brilliance, uh, uh, set forth a nuclear holocaust and we wiped out that tail, um, it would grow back. It would not be any of the same species we know today. Intelligence might never show up again. Uh, that could be just a happenstance of what the conditions were during th that early period. But that's something to kind of keep in mind about uh, complexity uh, and, and uh, that sort of thing. But aren't humans truly unique in complexity and intelligence? Yes, we win the IQ test and we're very complex. But uh, protozoa here, much of the, our genetics, much of our genetic complexity in our own bodies, in all living things, is really wrapped up, uh, you know, we share with the protozoa. Much of Earth life's complexity was worked out in those first two or three billion years and has to do with cellular biology. Um, some of you may know about Darwin's last book, a 300-page treatise on earthworms and their importance to cycling, uh, recycling, and geology. In there, he devoted 50 pages of 300 pages of his last book to earthworm intelligence. Um, now, I was looking for a human that you know would be complex. I was looking for Mon Mona Lisa or something, and I don't know. I came up with Penelope Cruz. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've always thought, I've never met her, but I, I, I would think of her as being a very complicated woman. She looks very complicated. <laughs> but, but look at Giuseppe. I mean, what's going on in that mind? Um, you know, there's, I'm joking around, but you know, uh, what I want to point out is that complexity, again, is a matter of degree. Um, intelligence, oh, yes, the smartest man in the, that ever lived, some would say. Certainly one of the most brilliant people of the 20th century. Einstein, but when Einstein was about, you know, until he was about two and a half years old, he probably would flunk, well, he would, he would not do as well in an IQ test as that monkey or most primates. In fact, until he was age five or seven, he probably did not have the same level of self-awareness as an adult chimpanzee. Um, so it's kind of age dependent, um, but, uh, but certainly we do, I'm not arguing that we, we don't have, um, you know, some amazing abilities with abstract thought. So now I want to go through and talk about complexity and intelligence. And each of these topics I've got on this list are worth a seminar on themselves. I'm just going to run through um, some things that actually have come to light really in my career. Um, one of the first is uh, the Human Genome Project. Now, when I was younger, the thought was the estimates for the human genome were 50,000 to 140,000 genes. We had to be the most, we had, of course, with the most complicated creatures, we had to have the most genes. It turns out we had 30,000, um, which is, you know, uh, good news. It's about 30% more than a nematode, but it's about 30% less than a tomato. Uh, so that kind of blows that theory. Of course, I know the geneticists out there going, what about splice genes? What about we've gone beyond one gene, one protein? There, we've come up with our explanations for why, you know, this doesn't hold anymore and this isn't a good the only indicator of complexity, but just to point out a few things that have changed. Our genetic makeup we have found is not that unique. We knew we were closely related to the chimpanzees and other primates, but we didn't know that 99% of our genes are similar to chimpanzees. And then, of course, immediately the thought was when we found this out, oh yeah, so that's all, that all has to do with brain power. I want 1% more genes going into our amazing brain power. It turns out that many of those genes have to do with larynx development. And in fact, our frontal lobes, while the average brain size of humans is, is larger than most primates, the frontal lobe, which is any uh, brain scientists here, that's where rational thought comes from, is about the same as many primates. The neurochemicals associated with emotional feelings and behavior are also observed in many species we previously assumed functioned instinctively. So oxytocin, which is, comes, uh, we can detect in humans during Mother-daughter, uh, mother-child bonding shows up in other species. Serotonin, dopamine, all kinds of emotional um, uh, neurochemicals show up in other species. So if they're instinctive, then we're instinctive too, or, or, or else they are much more like us than we thought. Many social animals have sophisticated language skills, and I imagine this group would follow some of the news about that. Uh, everything from prairie dogs to dolphins to, of course, primates. And then we're learning more about um, body language and that sort of thing. Abstract thought does now require language for some research on pre-verbal infants as well as some animals. 
several uh, other species have surprising levels of self-awareness. The one that kind of really got to me is a fairly recent report about dolphins who in their first year of life name themselves, come up with a name for themselves. And not only that, but, but uh, others of their species who might leave them for some years and come back can remember their names, which is beyond what many humans can do. <laughs> uh, and the other thing is, uh, there have been conversations as we're cracking the code of dolphin dialogue, there's been conversations between dolphins where they are naming another, you know, the, the, the name of another uh, of their species is, is being brought up. Many other species use tools in sophisticated ways, and this goes way beyond uh, primates, particularly bird species. And size doesn't matter when it comes to brains, uh, particularly bird brains. Um, uh, pigeons is a recent study showing pigeons have numerical uh, cap capacity uh, up to the scale of many primates. So, and this is actually the modern genetic sort of way of, the correct sort of way phylogenetically to describe our, our place um, within our closest relatives. And you see we aren't really above the rest. Um, and why don't we really celebrate this kinship? Um, I'm not sure. Um, I think that's one thing I would like to sort of bring out in this discussion today is, is talk about that, how really um, instead of thinking of ourselves about being above everybody else, recognizing the kinship, and yet of course unique, recognizing our unique capacity is important. Darwin had some thoughts on this. He, he saw this coming. And animals who have, we have made our slaves, we do not like to treat as equals. It's not convenient. Um, okay, continuing with our notion of superiority, science versus the mystical mind, the spiritual mind, the unbounded intelligence. So I've given, while we have superior intelligence, it's not a royal trait, except in our own minds. Like other traits, uh, dogs have, a, have the ability for, to pick up certain scents 10,000 times of what humans can do. Um, there is a continuum of ability among species with intelligence, and excelling at one single trait does not guarantee evolutionary success. Our intelligence is also constrained by the context of its evolution, and I'm going to have some slides to follow which are going to bring this into gear in particular to climate change how the context of what the world was like, the climate was like, as our minds evolve, affects our ability to deal with climate change. The trait, as I mentioned when I was showing the new tree of life, is a very recent introduction. And whether it will be adapted over the long haul has not been established. In fact, it may be maladaptive, as it may lead to an illusion of separateness from other species that we know is not true based on what we know about ecology an illusion of unbounded and unbiased um, mental capacity. That, uh, that self-awareness issue can really become a bit of a trap for ourselves and um, lead us into a place where we, we can't, really can't get out of it. Is it the ultimate achievement of intellect, our self-awareness, or a source of delusion? What did the smartest man in the world have to say about that? We experience ourselves, our thoughts and feelings, as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of consciousness. The delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. OK, now I want to turn my attention to getting into a little more details about the context of our evolution and how this might affect our response to climate change. The human mind evolved primarily to respond to local conditions. It was, it's a natural selection. It came from a brain, an organ. It didn't come from the spirits above. It's not different than the ability of birds and their wings to fly. It's, it's constrained by what our, how our brain evolved. And that brain evolved in response to natural selection, which was not dealing with abstract global challenges on the other side of the planet, local challenges. And so here I think climate change among environmental problems is uniquely difficult to deal with compared to, for example, fracking or local water pollution problem, uh, it's the, which are, can be very local. On the other hand, the, many people are afraid of the, the reaction to climate change. That is, 
a policy, for example, that might affect their local economy. In other words, a gas tax, which is going to make their life, their local environment more difficult. So there's this kind of two-pronged issue where people, many people, are more afraid of the local consequences of a policy reaction to climate change than they are to some abstract global threat. Um, like all products of evolution, human consciousness is actually pragmatic in nature. While capable of abstract thought, our minds are more interested in the concrete. I suppose at a place like Cornell, you do tend to find more people that are you know, quite fascinated with the abstract. Uh, I'm, I'm there. Um, but, but really, if you look at the human species at large, uh, we're much more interested in what works, not why it works. And, and that really is the consequence, again, of evolving, the mind evolving through natural selection. You know, one thing our intellect has done is create complex social structures. In part, many, uh, there's one school of thought that in part our complex social structures, whether it be governments or religions, are a you know, response to the anxiety of this sense of agency and choice that we have, this sense of self-determination. So that instead of having to make all these choices ourselves, we let the group that we belong to make some of those choices for us. It could be everything from going to war to not doing anything about climate change, or it could be on the positive side. Um, so our social structures can work for us or against us, but they can actually, in many cases, limit our capacity for choice. Many uh, recent climate change studies have shown, some surveys have shown, that uh, even shown solid evidence of climate change right in their neighborhood, depending on the social group people are with, they may or may not believe in climate change. Our minds evolved over a long period when there were very few humans on the planet and abundant resources. Over 100,000 more years Homo sapiens have been around, and during almost all of that time until the last couple hundred years, the pressure on our resources uh, was not like it is today. So it was quite, our, our minds evolved in a time when we could go out and get what we needed from the resources uh, around us. Of course, there's some local issues, some local times when uh, for example, Jared Diamond in his book Collapse talks about things can still locally become um, restrictive. But in general, um, we, we have that sort of issue to get around. We now are in a, on a planet where um, we have many more people. In our minds evolved in a period of climate stability compared to current and projected climate change. So now I've got a few slides to kind of go through, emphasize a few of those things. The thing about human population and I know it's not very clear from the back, but you don't need to see the details. Really. This graph in the upper right, this is showing, uh, going back to 10,000 BC, uh, showing the number of humans on the planet. And actually, of course, you know, Homo sapiens have been around another, at least another 80, 90,000 years, depending on the data you look at. But, you know, almost no humans, no humans during all that evolution of our minds. It's only been in the very recent past that we've had this skyrocketing in population. Um, so from this, you can see why it's, you know, our brains have not really evolved to keep up with that sort of population growth. This is just another way of illustrating this. Um, at the time of uh, Jesus Christ, there were 250 million people, it's estimated, on the planet. It took 1,500 years to double that to 500 million. It took Homo sapiens about 120,000 years to, to produce 1 billion people on the planet. Now it's taking us just a little around a decade to add a billion. Climate change. This is going back um, 400,000 years. Um, so keeping it somewhere within the confines of our genus and its evolution. Here's the temperature trace. Uh, CO2, as we all know, greenhouse gases correlate with temperature. These ice ages are caused by actually uh, astronomical features, Earth orbital changes, Earth tilt of the axis changes that are pretty well understood, at least they're triggered by that. Um, Homo sapiens came back, let's say, around here. Oh, that looks like some, well, that's pretty rapid change. Let's look at this one coming out of the last ice age into the Holocene, the stable, relatively stable period, rather. That looks like a very rapid change, but keep in mind, um, you know, this is 10,000 years. 
It took about 20,000 years to rise about 8 degrees centigrade, 9 degrees centigrade, which is about 0.1 degree centigrade per 100 years. 0.1 degree centigrade per 100 years. Keep that figure in your head when I talk about what's projected for this century. In my next slide, I'm just going to show a very recent period, just going back about you know, 12,000 years, um, the Younger Dryas period from here to here and the Holocene. So uh, about 11,000 years ago or so, end of the last glacial, we had a rise with the Younger Dryas of about 4.5 degrees centigrade, 8.1 degrees, over the course of a couple thousand years. That too is less than something like half a degree C per 100 years. Um, the medieval warm period was a very dramatic period in the medieval times. Um, people began colonizing Greenland and farming there. Then came along the famous Little Ice Age, so-called Little Ice Age. It wasn't a real ice age. But that was a temperature drop of about one degree C. Again, I'm showing you these numbers to put it in context of the climate change that's projected for our century. What did that Little Ice Age drop do? What were the impacts of that? Communities were completely abandoned in Greenland, Iceland, and Northern Europe. Average male height declined across Northern Europe. The Pope ordered witch hunts to figure out who was causing this little ice age. That's what a one degree C drop can do. Um, here's that CO2 and that graph I showed you going back 400,000 years. At the top, I had the CO2 trace going back and forth 400,000 years, back and forth between about 200 and 280. This is just focusing on the CO2 trace, and this is what's happened in very recent times. Uh, currently, we're, we've risen about 0.8 degrees C, 1.4 degrees, just in the, since the Industrial Revolution. And of course, the spooky part is the, the trajectory we're on now in terms of CO2. That's the uh, business as usual scenario. Here's if we really get our act together and start slowing this down. But look at the magnitude of these even sort of a best case scenario uh, compared to some of the magnitudes I talked. So do we think our minds have really, can really wrap around this? I think there's some challenges there. In case you're like, you know, feeling sort of uh, special, thinking about how we can impact the climate change. Now again, you know, we're superior because only we could do that to the climate. I suppose many of you in this room would know who did that before us. The cyanobacteria, the first photosynthetic organisms, took our, uh, about two billion years ago, uh, invented photosynthesis, which took up CO2, gives off oxygen, wiped out mass extinctions of anaerobic uh, species that lived on the planet. When multicellular plant life came on, it rose the C uh, oxygen level even further with more photosynthesis. So uh, we're not alone in being able to do that. Um, OK, we're on our grand uh, climate change experiment. Phase one is complete. <laughs> Completed in my career. I didn't expect it. Um, despite clear floor warning, and maybe this is uh, you know, my bias, I thought we were clear, but maybe not. Uh, we did not have the mental capacity to avoid a magnitude of climate change that will negatively affect at least some humans and other species. Phase two is in progress. Will we have the capacity to cope with, that is simply adapt, to some of the inevitable climate change underway? How good is our intelligence, our capacity uh, to work together, et cetera? Phase three is also in progress. Will we have the capacity to prevent, mitigate, a truly catastrophic change in climate? What's a catastrophic change in climate? Well, I mean, some people think it's, you know, it's all just going to be warmer and better, and it's not catastrophic at all, of course. Um, others say it's a matter of degree, and there's certain things that could be OK and nice, and some that might not. Let me just show you something from a recent science that kind of spooks me a bit. This is from a recent article by Diffenbaugh and Chris Field in Science, coming out actually in the most recent Intergovernmental Panel Climate Change Studies. This puts into perspective what happens uh, if we burn up all the fossil fuels. That's what this graphic is really about. Um, on here is something that should be familiar to you, except it's on, again, on an even smaller scale. This is that CO2 trace going back 800,000 years here, up and back between 200 and 280 parts per million, thousands of years 
before the present, 800,000 years. Here's the various scenarios, fossil fuel use scenarios that we talk about playing out this century, possibly up to 800 parts per million or so. And I gave you some numbers about what that could mean, five degrees, six, seven degrees C uh, rise in temperature. Here's where we go if we burn up all the fossil fuels, which has been estimated at 20,000 gigatons. Um, 2,000 parts per million. I told you at the beginning I've done a lot of CO2 research on plants. And one thing, you know, one sort of little silver lining to some of the climate change work has been that when plants are exposed to higher CO2 levels because they take CO2 for photosynthesis to grow, it can benefit some plant species. But we never went up to 2,000, uh, not very often. And in fact, when you do, the leaves curl, they get starch grains, and the plants don't do very well at all. So that CO2 level, even if there weren't a concomitant climate change, would wreak, wreak havoc on a lot of plant life on the planet. Um, it's a, imagine that this would uh, speculate this will diminish over time due to photosynthetic uptake and some other things. Uh, but that level, um, you've all probably read the information about what even this level might mean for sea level rise, et cetera. Uh, that could be uh, close to catastrophic. Not that there won't be any humans left on the planet, but they're all going to be in the highlands of Ithaca, New York. <laughs> um, I just got this cartoon there for a little break. Um, bringing back, uh, I'd like to bring in these, you know, powerful big time thinkers here to support my arguments. Darwin is not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent that survives. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. He didn't put a lot of faith in intelligence. Can we successfully think our way through our self-imposed environmental challenges? That's the question I pose to you now. I'll come up with a couple pieces of evidence looking for a way to leave you with some optimism. And now there are some. I'm, you know, I've been uh, uh, heavy on the negative. We have turned a corner on human population growth rate. I did not think this would happen when I was young and read Ehrlich's population bomb. We have actually made some significant changes. Um, this is from a recent science article showing dramatic reductions in the global fertility rate. There's some exceptions. Uh, continental Africa, many nations there still have fairly high fertility rates. This wasn't really intentional. It wasn't really, um, you know, in all cases, something where we got, we're reaching a maximum of our resources. Sometimes it was um, simply a focus on poverty or social justice, uh, uh, gender issues, uh, education of women as well as men, uh, et cetera. But I think a real example of something to be optimistic about. Well, I think in the case of China's official one-child policy, it was intentional. Yes, that's, that's exactly true. I would say it was that, that's an intentional example, right? <laughs> Which has its own, you know, I mean, might have issues about that, but it was intentional. Um, ecological models now more clearly recognize human societies as part of natural systems. Ecologists are doing this routinely. Uh, this is something from Terry Chapin, Matson of Acoustic, a climate change model, and very strong emphasis on social systems in there. I think that's a very positive uh, sign. We have begun to acknowledge and even celebrate our kinship with other species. Just a few months ago, uh, India declared dolphins non-human persons with special rights. Uh, so several other countries have done the same thing. It means you can't have them in captivity, you can't have them doing tricks for you, uh, a variety of things um, going on there. I think we're learning about, a lot about framing the discourse on climate change. I like this quote. Um, you know, when we, when we talk, uh, particularly to people who we're trying to bring into the issue, not people who are very familiar and ready to go at it and start fixing things, um, my opinion is that the best we can do, especially as we're a lot of nature lovers here in the Natural Resources Department, most of us are in a department like this or affiliated with a department like this because of our passion for the natural world, actually being, I would say, almost in love with the natural world. I think sharing that is probably the most productive thing we can do in terms of at least getting people on the right course rather than talking to them about how polluted the world is and how they, they've got something they've got to do to fix it. 
That can come later. Um, but people don't want to destroy that which they love. And I think part of uh, what is so wonderful about the world is actually our connection with other species, our similarities and not our differences. On a more kind of concrete level, uh, communications um, researchers have done a lot on framing the issues and they've kind of come up with some approaches that I think were uh, discovered because they work. Um, but actually, from what I've talked about in this seminar, I think you can see there's some, uh, it, it relates to some of these evolutionary constraints. Uh, communication now by emphasizing the human and the local impacts, not the global impacts. And emphasizing practical solutions and economically viable alternatives to the path we're on. And to the extent we respond to local, well, the local impacts are changing mindsets here and there. Um, when people have to pay the costs of adapting, dealing with uh, climate change, even among the farmers that I work closely with, uh, the most recent and intensive and comprehensive survey in the Midwest of um, something like 6,000 uh, farmers, uh, maybe it's 40, I'm sorry, 4,800 farmers, uh, found that over 65% uh, said they, quote, believed in climate change. Not all of them were convinced humans were causing it, but the majority felt it was human caused. Um, there's a lot we can see around us. Uh, individuals, local communities, governments, corporations attempting to make a difference. For some of my friends in the room, I've got Solarized Caroline there. Uh, <laughs> Walmart gets a lot of, um, you know, bad press, and it's got some issues now with pay rates for employees, I know. Uh, and whether this is just greenwashing or how deep it goes, but just the, just the fact that they feel like they need to do this is, I think, a sign in the right direction. And of course, the UN IPCC, again, I might be biased because I've been affiliated in various ways. Um, you know, I think that that's an example of our social structures actually doing a decent job. So is an intelligence an adaptive trait? It will be up to us to demonstrate that as so, particularly the younger people in the room. Until then, it's really not a fact. It's a, it's a belief, it's a faith, and it's a hope. And I'll leave you with this quote that I like. If you look at the science about what is happening on Earth and aren't pessimistic, you don't understand data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore this Earth and the lives of the poor and you aren't optimistic, you haven't got a pulse. <laughs> Um, I have some references here for those who are interested, but I think I'll just leave it with that slide and take questions. Thanks. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.